all the ICU docs were like, we could not do our job nearly as well if we didn't have the pharmacists here because we just don't know that much. Well, it's it's crazy because, you know, you think about somebody that's been practicing for a really long time and, and you know, 60 years or something like that. There was like, I don't know what, 10 antibiotics and a couple of antihypertensives and, and that was it. Yeah. Right. And now we have, I don't even know how many antibiotics, cre- you know. It seems or, like my, my Micromedex app updates every other day. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's not a small update either. Yeah. So it's like the number of drugs is just crazy. And then you think about the way physicians are trained and how much drug therapy they get. And, and it's so small. Same with, um, same for paramedics. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, here's a very select amount of drugs. Yeah. And maybe a, uh, we, we get a, a pharmacology book with, and we have to memorize 50 drugs. Maybe. If that, and if it's, that. it's mostly ACLS drugs. You don't really get a solid grasp of the true principles of pharmacology or pharmacokinetics or or how drugs just work in the context of physiology or pathophysiology. Mm-hmm. So that's an important distinction, too, that is not often made. So Regan is a PharmD uh, practicing at the University of Kentucky. Are you specifically in an emergency department? Yeah. PharmD? Yeah. So I'm always in the emergency department. So cool. I finished school. You know, and at the end of four years of pharmacy school, you're licensed to practice. So it's a little bit different than like a physician where they get done with medical school. They got to go do their residencies. They got to do all that stuff. So pharmacists, there is residencies, which is what I did. So we did two years, one year of general, one year of emergency medicine specialty. You know, so it's not necessarily required for pharmacists. But if you want to be in a center sort of like we have here in in Lexington, um, it's sort of what you need to be competitive for that job market. And then, you know, when I came out of residency and I was looking at um, trying to find residencies, there was 16 spots in the U.S. that were training emergency medicine pharmacists. So we had two of the spots here in Lexington. So now there's quite a few more. I think, uh, I think last look there was 40 or 50. So it's obviously going up. That's still not a whole, that's a whole lot of competition. It's, I mean, it's brand new, right? So, I mean, in reality, it's pretty new. So you think about like critical care and, and some of the other specialties, pediatrics, they've been around for decades and decades, right? So EM is pretty new. I've heard a physician say, well, uh, I can't give that drug or it's kind of like they were discussing the off-label use for something. They said, well, I can't give that because my PharmD won't let me. <laughs> <laughs> Who was it? <laughs> Belcher. Yeah. <laughs> we probably told him no. He probably heard it on a podcast and we said no. <laughs> no I'm just kidding. So is that how that works? No. I mean, do you, are, are there certain drugs that have to go through you? Do I get in a pissing contest with people over yes or no is like sort of the sugar-coated question. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do consult on a lot of stuff. I would say that our recommendations at UK right now get taken with a, with a high amount of respect, right? So, you know, the, the reason why I love my job is because I work with a bunch of people that appreciate that I'm there and appreciate the training that I have and appreciate, you know, the I've been in the ER now since 2014, appreciate the time that I've spent down there and and what I've seen and what I bring to the table. Right. So it's rare that I get into a situation where if I feel really strongly about something that we don't have like a pretty good dialogue about it. This is what I think. This is why I'm really worried about it. I mean, I'm not going to say it never happens. It does occasionally happen. But in my time at UK, I have put drugs down and walked out of the room one time and refused to help somebody. Wow. So one time. Um, now, there have been times when there's been like discussion, you know, like yeah. I don't necessarily agree with what you're doing. Do I think it's probably not harmful? Yes. Right. Like, but I don't agree because I think X, Y, and Z or whatever. But, you know, so we have a really nice mutual dialogue and I have a lot of respect for the physicians and the nurses and the paramedics. I mean, I've learned a ton from you guys that have been in the department. Um, you know, the chaplain, like, uh, it's crazy the amount of people that you have in the ER that we work with all the time, respiratory therapy, um, that I've learned a lot of stuff from. So, you know, there are things probably if I put my foot down, I could, uh, but probably ultimately in the end, if we really, truly, if it was like came to head, like probably it's going to be the physician that's going to win, but that doesn't really happen because we have like a really nice. It never gets to that point. No, because everybody is pretty good about communicating, you know, and and saying, you know, and if I say, look, this is what I'm worried about and this is what I think we ought to do instead, generally it's pretty well received. I'd say there's probably a different culture everywhere. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a, a huge determining factor. Yeah. Like, do I think that if I went to like 
I don't know, like small podunk, whatever, walked in and said something, they probably wouldn't listen to me, right? They'd probably be like, who are you? Yeah. Why are you here? Why are you speaking? But, but I don't have that at our shop, you know, so I'm, I'm pretty fortunate. We have a really nice collaborative practice. How often do you work with your toxicology fellows? So we don't have toxicology fellows at UK. So we have a, um, a medical toxicologist now. So he started with us um, in July. So two years ago or last year, I can't remember. Peter will be in, angry with me for not remembering, but <laughs> I work with him all the time. So we actually okay. are in the process of, you know, we have a toxicology um, service established, and then I am trying to get a clinical toxicology designation as well. Oh, so, cool. you know, we don't have fellows, we don't have residents in training for that specialty yet, but we are kind of, it is sort of a niche that we're working into. Yeah. Excellent. Mm-hmm. It's cool stuff, toxicology. I like it. I am not smart enough to understand it, mostly because I don't have the grasp of chemistry. Well, I mean, and it, like, frankly, it's just crazy, like, the amount of stuff that that, that the toxicology en encompasses is just huge, you know? I it mean, could literally be anything in the right amount. Yeah, yeah. And then you have all of the envenomation stuff. You have all the occupational exposure stuff. You have all the disaster preparedness stuff. You have every drug known to man. You've got you know, all of it. So it's, it's a crazy amount of information. Um, if you guys want to do something on toxicology, you should totally have Peter on. He's really cool. We should. We're going to do that. Yeah. Ryan, Ryan is excited. Now. Yeah. I love talks. I don't understand a lot of it, but I, it just, it's so cool to me. He yeah. does understand a lot. I, bet. I mean, you, I can tell that you guys do because when I was listening to your stuff, it's not like your stuff is super basic. You know, and I like, and I don't mean that in like a, but like your stuff is high level. Like we're if, basic bros. We're basic <laughs> bros. <laughs> I had Starbucks earlier today. But you know, when you target an audience, you're like, how deep do I go into information? Yeah. Right? Do I go down to like the molecular receptor level? Do I talk about like practical application? You know, and yeah. you guys are obviously talking about stuff on a high level. We want you know? practical stuff. We That's want what I we figured. want people to be able to use stuff. Yeah. So hopefully, after this podcast, they will comfortably and safely initiate a drip of whatever the patient needs. You said you were kind of doing your own random sampling of paramedics and kind of how they feel about vasopressors. What was the consensus? You know, because a lot of the guys were local. A lot of them, they don't have much transit time. So probably the utility of it for them is is pretty minimal. Yeah. You know, so if they're local in Lexington and they're six minutes away, there's probably not time for them to even be worrying about it. When I when I rode with uh, the fire department in Lexington, I was really surprised that there was no pumps. You know, things like that were really mm -hmm. surprising to me. So some of the logistics of those things that I think – on the hospital side, people don't always think about, right? So when you all roll in with a patient to us, it's really easy to be like, hey, why this, this, and this? But sometimes I think they don't realize some of the limitations and logistics that you guys are dealing with. And, you know, I think understanding that is important when you talk about transitions of care and that sort of thing. Yeah, and it's I've definitely gotten some weird looks rolling into UK on a ground unit with a pump going. But, yeah. Oh, we're not used to seeing this. <laughs> yeah. So... It, that's absolutely correct. We tend to constrain ourselves by not having the appropriate equipment. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's a, there's a large amount of debate as to whether or not a pump is appropriate for ground ambulance. My personal preference is yes. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be delivering some of the medications that we are expected to be able to deliver in a safe and competent manner, it should probably be done on a pump. Yeah. And you don't need to have the latest and greatest. You just need to have a nice regulated way to be able to deliver the, these medications. It would make everyone feel a lot safer. Something to And it honestly above. is safer for the patients. You, I would wager that you, I don't have any evidence to back this up, but free flowing vasopressors versus regulated delivered medication. The regulated delivered medication is probably going to be the safer of the two. Well, yeah, because I mean, especially when you take, you know, how big is your IV? How long is your line? How high is the bag? Like, is the patient's oh, arm bent? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is there a blood pressure cuff on that <laughs> arm? Like, how much stuff does all the little crazy. variables that kind of tweak? Yeah, it. and there? then you think about like hanging your bag, and then you're thinking about, okay, I want this much, and you're doing the math. But if you're stressed and you are not the person that is the most comfortable, then are you making? Yeah. You're making a med error, error right off the bat. Yeah. Because you're stressed, you know. I think I see people who are afraid to hang a vasopressor. Really? They won't get to the point where they pull the trigger. 
Um, they'll keep giving bolus after bolus after bolus of fluid, of fluid, uh-huh. thinking that after the next bolus, the blood pressure is going to get better. Yeah. After the next bolus, the blood pressure is going to get better. And all the vast majority of uh, pre-hospital providers have is dopamine. Yeah. And you have to use the 60 drop set. And I can tell you that if you move that dial. Um, just a little bit. Just like a centimeter, it's either wide open or it's too slow, too slow or too fast. And you can't get it just right. Um, yeah. A game played in micrograms probably shouldn't be delegated to the use of my thumb. Mm. If it's not to push a button. Y'all should like do a study on this and show how error prone it is as your like leverage for getting I have to look at the nursing literature. I'm sure there's I'm something sure there's out there something. in the nursing literature. Yeah. If we, if you could measure the actual rate versus what they think they're they're getting. Mm-hmm. Um, Going back to your point about the um, pre-hospital providers, I think there's not. If you take like the the sum of all the parts, stock initial education for a paramedic, a lot of the the focus on vasopressor centers on dopamine or mm-hmm. epi in essentially two situations: cardiac arrest or post ros care. Right. So there's not a whole. All, it hasn't been until fairly recently that the uh, even considering the notion of let's let paramedics give epinephrine or norepi for people who are in septic shock or who yeah. are in or frankly in cardiogenic shock or something like that. Yeah. Because you kind of touch on cardiogenic shock and stuff like that in your initial presentation or in your initial education. But a lot of people are just kind of and understandably so, especially when you haven't really been brought into a system that encourages that education of when to pull the trigger on a vase. I think a lot of people are scared to because it's a lack of experience. Mm-hmm. It's a lack of education. And it's also kind of considered a high acuity event to start vasopressors on pe- on a person in the field. Yeah. From our aspect, I think it's probably going to get looked at, but I don't think it should be necessarily a negative thing to just m- normalize hemodynamics when it's appropriate to do so. Right. And like the, you've got so many really good talking points in there. Um, you know, I think we could talk a little bit about what you guys have on the truck and, and why you probably have it on the truck. And you guys probably know this, but what you guys have on the truck is is dopamine, right? Mm-hmm. As your premix. Um, dopamine right now, to my knowledge, is is the only commercially available premix. So um, it, you can get premixes of epi and norepi. Mm-hmm. We have them in the hospital, but they're usually done by like an outsourcing man, an outsourcing manufacturer okay. or but or mm-hmm. by like a third party, not by does that make does that make sense? Yeah, Baxter isn't out there selling right. Yeah, epinephrine premix exactly, or Pfizer, or you know. So so that's part of the reason, uh, to my understanding, why you have dopamine, right? Because it's there, it's super stable. You can buy it from a manufacturer. It's probably cheap. Okay, so you can get the outsourced products. We actually have them in our ER. So in the ER, we don't make epi drips. We don't make nor epi drips. We don't make phenylephrine drips. We have an outsourced product. However, really? in the rest of the hospital, they actually make those things sterilely up in central pharmacy and then distribute okay. them because it's cost prohibitive for us to have them everywhere. Yeah. But the speed in the ER is advantageous, right? So having yeah. it quickly and not waiting for it. And in a standardized concentration. Yes, right. And then you bring into all of the different ways that we build safety into a system, which is part of my job security is how do I build safety into a system, right? So having standardized concentration is important, you know, so that's part of the reason why you guys have dopamine is because it's it's stable, it's cheap for a long time, there's a premix, you're not trying to like, mix a bag in the back of the truck. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> now, do I think that you know, there's probably enough evidence now to say that norepinephrine is probably preferred, right? And really what you're talking about when you're talking about norepinephrine being preferred, you're really talking about like a vasodilatory shock, like a sepsis or something like that, right? So the majority of patients that need vasopressors are probably that type of shock, right? Mm -hmm. That's really the biggest role for our vasopressors. Our trauma patients that are bleeding out probably need blood. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Preferentially. Ab- right. Obstructive <laughs> shock, like RPEs, that sort of stuff, probably need some sort of intervention. And then cardiogenic shock is like a whole different, really, really interesting beast, right, where you have ionotropes and that sort of stuff. But you guys, do you guys have any ionotropes on your truck, like just pure? No pure. No. No. So you basically have, you have epi or you have dopamine, do- dopamine right? It'd be cool if it carried milrinone on the truck. Or but- dopamine. Um, do you think that it would be... I think it's probably safer. I don't know. Do you think that it would be safer to hang dopamine 
and I'm not advocating any of this, but do you think it would be safer to hang dopamine under gravity or norepi under gravity? Knowing that dopamine is really arrhythmogenic and that if you give too much, you're really going to crank up the heart rate and can cause some pretty tacky arrhythmias. I mean, I think I think you guys have done the math with dopamine to figure out what your doses are and stuff, okay. right? So yeah. I don't have doubt that you couldn't do the math with an orepi. But my question is, is if you're to the point where, you know, you're in transit somewhere, you've given you've given fluids, people are not wholly comfortable with pressors, they're going to go to a presser, they're going to be doing it in the back of the truck that's moving, and they're going to have to make something and try to manipulate it and do all of those things. Is it in the in the purely from a speed and efficiency standpoint, is it worth it in the interim just to go with your premix, get them to the hospital, and we're going to switch them? Because we are. Yeah. Right? Like, we're not going to keep them on dopamine. And I don't think that we have evidence that says if you guys start dopamine in the field as a temporizing measure to stabilize that patient quickly, which is what you guys essentially need to do. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we have anything that says you're doing harm to the patient and you're going to see X, Y, Z arrhythmias and that sort of thing, right? You will have, you can have similar stuff with epinephrine as well, right? It can be a little bit more arrhythmogenic than probably what norepinephrine is because it does have more of that effect on the myocardium, more of the squeeze and and that sort of thing, you know, and you have other problems with epinephrine itself too. I I know some of the articles that you sent me that you want to talk about, like, you know, for instance, the increases in lactate and and its effect on um, endocrine system and the metabolism and that sort of stuff, um, you know, is problematic too. But the question is really for me under speed is what can you get quickly? If you have somebody truly crashing, is it better for you to get something on to support them in the short term, you know, versus them just crumping? And what I think we'll, we'll probably discuss this later in the, in the realm of peri speed. That's when my, my preference is, is to opt with a uh, basically push dose epi mm-hmm. and use that as a temporizing measure to get them onto a, an actual, be it do, uh, dopamine or mm-hmm. epi. Mm-hmm. Now, where I have the the, uh, the the good fortune to be able to carry a pump, I can actually put them on a dedicated epinephrine drip. Yeah. But I've had that situation where we are going to arrest if we don't do something, and fluids is not going to cut it. Yeah. So use the push dose epi and temporize them over to an actual stable drip. But that's not the reality for most of ground EMS, unfortunately, at least as it stands right now. Right. Right. Yeah, no, I can totally see that. And I can see like, you know, that, that to me is the role of like the, the push dose pressures, you kind of alluded to it. But when you start getting into some of those therapies, and, it, and you know, dirty epi drip is the same thing for me. A lot of people once they start down that road are not always thinking about what their end game is. Yes. Right? Like, but you got to have an end game. Like in our guys, when we started using the stuff in the in the ED, they would be like, I want to do push dose epinephrine. I'm like, great. What do you want to do after that? I want to do push dose epinephrine. And I'm like, great. Are you going to stand at the bedside and do that for the next two hours? I just want to know for a friend. You know, because like, what am I going to keep making you push dose? You know, so you have to really be thinking about what is your end game, right? Yeah. And, and does your temporizing measure... If it gets you to your end game, great. But sometimes I think we do temporizing measures that just delay your end game. Does that make sense? So it just you're taking more time to do all of these different manipulations. And would you just be better off just putting your effort into X, Y, and Z drip, right? Yeah. Um, and so sometimes depending on the situation, I question that. So like in the hospital, for instance, push dose pressors we do, right? Um you know, we have a tendency in the hospital to use more phenylephrine sticks. So the phenylephrine pushes, do you guys have those on the trucks? No, we don't carry phenyl. Okay. Unless it's afrin. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> just, I don't, like, you'd hook that up to the line. Just and, <laughs> breathe real deep, okay? Yeah, yeah exactly. There's nasal absorption thing, right? <laughs> you know, we use that probably pretty more frequently than the epi, although I think from a mechanistic stan- mechanism standpoint, I sort of like the epinephrine a little bit better. Um, but you know, in our setting where we're going to go to probably a drip anyway, unless it's RSI, right? If it's RSI and we're expecting like this transient change in, you know, thoracic yeah. pressure where we're going to see low blood pressures and we aren't, we aren't anticipating it be a long term. Okay. Maybe. Right. Mm-hmm. But the rest of the time you probably need an end game. And in my setting, going to the end game may be the best thing. Right. But in your guys' setting, it's a little bit different, right? Yeah. Because your end game sometimes takes more time and you have less resources. So, um, I think just kind of being aware globally of that is important. Can we can we touch on uh, physiology and mechanisms? Like, how do these various 
uh, I, I think we freely use the term vasopressor. Yeah. But there are many different terms. There's inotropes, pressors, inopressors. I know. And then some people call them uh, alpha agents, beta agents. And I think that confuses people more than anything else. So, And then I think people are confused by how pressors or inotropes work. And, and we've, we've talked on this, and maybe this is just something that's in vogue. Um, but um, the theory is that you have to prime the pump. And I think there's something to that. But I think you need to give just the right amount of fluid. But in our, our field... It's hard to know what just the right amount of fluid is. Mm -hmm. So I advocate early pressors, and I'm interested in knowing what you think about that and answer that in whatever order you want. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's a question a lot of people are asking right now. Um, You know, how much fluid should we give people? I mean, it's a million dollar question right now. There are people, we were doing a study on it. Should we do pressors early? Should we give more fluid? Like what, you know, so the jury is a little bit out. Um, And I think your question on that topic is uh, well-founded. What should you do is is the question. Um, It depends, right? So I think you have to think about how do you, what do you have to monitor what you're giving, right? So if you give fluid, how do you know that the patient is fluid responsive? (laughs) Because I'm guessing you're not monitoring urine output, right? Which is no. what they would do in the ICU. No, not unless they have a Foley in place right. and you have a transport time long enough to observe. Right, we right. We have um, basically blood non- pressure, inv- non invasive telemetry, heart yeah. rate, and clinical entitled CO2. Yeah. yeah, and maybe and mental status, right? Pulse ox plethysmography. <laughs> your pulse wave, th- you again with your pulse wave variability. <laughs> oh, dear Lord. <laughs> it's cool. I don't know if it's practical. So we sort of have these surrogate markers, right? And, and I think what's hard is sometimes those surrogate markers aren't always reliable, okay? Oh God, no. So if you have somebody that runs baseline with their systolic blood pressures in the 200s, 220s, and now their systolic is downwards of 80 or 90, and you're giving them fluid and you've got, like, their, their goals are probably different than my goals or your goals. You guys both look pretty fit, right? You know, so it's hard. It's hard to, sur- to as a surrogate marker, to monitor that in the field and know exactly how much fluid to give, right? So is, is, it, is it more harmful to give too much fluid or more harmful to start a uh, presser early when a patient's properly fluid loaded? And that's a that's good question, a, that's too. A tough question. Yeah, that's a good question, too. And it probably depends a little bit on past medical history, which I don't know about you guys, but I feel like we never know enough of, right? No. And I think when you guys are thinking about the type of shock, that really determines a lot about what we would like to do. It determines a lot about what we do when, once they get to the ER. Um, and like I said, most of the time, it's usually distributive in nature. But like when we start trying to tease out other things that are going on, we're doing, using a whole bunch of additional diagnostic, you know, ultra sound, imaging, that sort of stuff. So it's hard, like on the outpatient side, there's not a perfect, like I can't tell you today from now on, I want you to give everybody 500 cc's <laughs> yeah. uh, and then see if their blood pressure responds. And then after that, go straight, because you you just can't, right? Like there's just not a perfect answer and we're ne- we're probably never going to have that perfect answer. Everyone thinks they know I and know. then they're, they're usually wrong. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of the, the, the way medicine has been for 2000 yeah. years too. Yeah. Like we think we got it right. And then oh, we only got the part of it out. right or something else added to our understanding. I mean, I think if you're giving somebody fluid and you feel like you're not seeing any of your markers change, mm-hmm. right. And you feel like they're still not perfusing appropriately. There's not good blood flow. You're not getting um, oxygen to tissues, that sort of stuff. That's probably the time where I would think about a presser. And then the question is, you know, there's some evidence that maybe starting at the presser a little bit early as opposed to like waiting till they're going down the drain, right, yeah. is probably better. Okay. Um, Stay ahead of the curve a yeah, little bit. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, that's a that's a much bigger deal when you're out in your area and you've got an hour transit time versus if you're in Lexington and you're six minutes, right? You know, that's a much bigger deal. And so your guys' thoughts on this, um, it's really good questions, but there's unfortunately, I don't have like a... This number every time here, we'll lay out the bras low <laughs> tape. Do they have heart failure? Yes or no. Yeah. Educate us on the the nomenclature and what it means. Kind of. Oh, gonna, yeah. Yeah. The, what did the drips do? Sorry. So many questions. Okay. I get lost. You have to remind me. <laughs> That's fine. All right. So 
I think I think there's a couple ways to think about this. You know, the way that that I was taught it in school was what receptor does it act on? And I realize not everybody works in receptor world and that that doesn't make sense to everyone and it's confusing. All right. So if you think about just pure vasopressors, right? So just pure things that take your unstressed volume, right? And change it essentially to stressed and push more blood back to the heart. So stuff that just squeezes on the vasculature. We just have a couple things that are out there now, right? So we have phenylephrine, okay? Mm -hmm. And then we have vasopressin, right? So just pure, they don't do anything else, okay? So then where you get into this mixed bag, which is what you all have on your truck right now. So stuff that works in the vasculature to give you the squeeze, and then also gives your pump a little bit of squeeze too. Okay. And and that's norepi, which is probably the one that arguably has the best evidence right now. Okay. Um, and then dopamine and epinephrine are in there as well. Okay. So they do a little bit of both. Um, norepi has a little bit less squeeze on the heart than the other ones, right? So it does mostly the vasculature. And, and you know, what people say is, you know, when you squeeze the vasculature, when I talk about squeezing the vasculature, you're squeezing the arterial side and the venous side. Both. Is it equally or is it one more than the other? Um, I think it's pretty equal. Um, I'd have to double check to be 100% sure, but I consider it kind of like in a very similar manner, which is why, you know, when you think about that, that's why it's important that it has a little bit of ionotropy, right? Because if you are just squeezing on the back side of the heart, are you preventing that left side of the heart that's shooting blood out to the body? Are yeah. you sort of preventing it from doing that, making it harder work for the heart? Does that make sense? So that's why mm -hmm. like yep. phenylephrine really we almost never use as a presser anymore because all it is doing, although it's probably working on both sides of the system, really probably what it's causing is more work for the heart because it doesn't have anything to sort of support it on the back end. And I think that's probably why norepinephrine is a little bit better niche presser for us. Okay. I think that's why Weingart calls it the purest vasopressor. Yes, yeah. he does. Yeah. You know, and then when you think about like the ionotropes that we have now, like the dobutamine and the milrinone and that sort of thing. The thing that makes them hard is they're really not just ionotropes. So they also vasodilate. Vasodilate. Which is nice if you have heart failure, right? Decrease and you're trying the afterload. To, yeah, because mm -hmm. you can decrease the afterload, but it's problematic if you're trying to... Does that Perfuse. make sense? Yeah. So sometimes we'll end up in these very like, you know, an ionotrope with a vasopressor both, like like a combination. Um, you know, but but your goals with your things that are your ionotropes and your vasodilators are different, right? We're not titrating those to blood pressure. You're not really titrating those to a heart rate. You're not, you know, it's a very different goal. So, um, you know, to use those things well, it's really nice to have monitoring, right? So either yeah. catheters or echo, that sort of stuff, right? So, you know, which is out of the scope of this, right? So then the question yeah. is, is what do you all need to know? You probably need to know those ones in the middle, right? The ones that are vasoactive, right? And then also work on the heart as well. So. So I teach people that the, the, in distributive shock, it's more of a problem with uh, the vessel size than it is actually them losing volume or losing fluid. Yeah. And then if you give that presser, then you are turning all of this, um, this unstressed volume or this potential volume and you're increasing preload that way. Yes. So they already have this large uh, reservoir of volume and blood in their body that they just can't uh, tap into. And we're helping them tap into that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Does that sound accurate? Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like the like the water balloon analogy. Have you heard that for the stressed, unstressed so. volume? So it's like, okay, your unstressed volume, you have a water balloon, you put water in it and it fills the balloon, but not enough to stretch it. Right. Okay. That's your unstressed volume. Okay. If you fill it beyond that, that's your stressed volume. Okay. When somebody with sepsis, have you ever done the thing where you like blow the water balloon up and then you let it out a whole bunch of times and then the water balloon gets like real stretchy yeah. and kind of yeah. leaky and that. So that's, that's distributive shock. Right. So the presser, what it does is it helps sort of yeah. push that back in that way and make the the integrity of the mem membrane better. I think I think some people are just afraid the heart's going to explode uh, or, or something. Some Add strange undue stress. It's still a game of of micrograms. And the, the good thing about yeah. all this is, is it's it's titratable. I mean, insofar as most ambulances can actually titrate that medication. So 
I I don't think it's a founded fear. I think it. I think that fear has foundation. Uh, that and but it's not in the fact that the patient is literally going to die because you gave them medication. I think the fear is centered in: Am I going to cause this already very sick patient harm? Yeah. Uh, which mm-hmm. is always that. I mean, that's at the forefront of our minds whenever we initiate any therapy. Um, I think what would help mitigate that fear is just a good solid understanding of what these things are and how they act in the body, and that there is a dose response curve to everything we do. Mm-hmm. So. A lot of medics have their favorite dopamine range. Like they always start out at a flat range. Mm-hmm. And then they're going to judge their experience with that agent based upon one range without sliding it up or down. Well, and it's hard. Like I even see it. So we have a, a lot of newer nursing staff mm-hmm. and it's the same thing, right? It's the same thing at a hospital with a pump and they've got like the card that tells them, you know, it, it's hard. Like until that's the thing, like that's the thing that's really cool about hemodynamics and vasopressors is it's as much an art as it is a science. OK, mm. so the more that you use them, probably the more comfortable that you'll yeah. be with yeah, them and, and the better you'll be at titrating them. But if you don't use them a lot, they're probably going to scare the crap out of you. Or, you know, will it be like they'll sit there on the same rate and you won't know what to do, you know. Um, and so it's it's. You are not alone, right? You're not alone that, that you're you have people that struggle with this, right? It, it's I think common. it's also that it's it's fairly low, low frequency. Mm-hmm. For us, so typically when you when you start initiate a vasoactive medication in the field, it's like a thing for the shift to know mm-hmm. or something to kind yeah. of be like, hey, I got to start an epi drip last night. It was super cool. Yeah. But if you, a pharmacist and a tertiary ED, were to go home and be like, I started an epi drip in the ER last mm-hmm. night, it would be like, isn't that your job? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I think it's one of those things too. Once you do it the first few times, it's like. It's really not a big deal. Like Yeah, the, and especially once you start yeah. – now, granted, this is with the caveat that you're doing all this with the proper training and the protocols. But under the proper guidance, you start pushing out on your dosages, up or down, mm-hmm. uh, and seeing the, the responses you get in different types of patients. Because when you apply the same dose across an entire cohort of patients that are probably vastly different, mm-hmm. then you're going to get different responses. Like, oh, I gave dopamine to this one guy and his blood pressure shot up to 298. And then I gave dopamine to another patient and their blood pressure stayed at 50. Well, how far are we sliding up or down on this curve? Are you going by fives? Are you going by tens? So I think it's it's mostly an exposure thing and a training thing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, I think I think the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll be with it. Um, you know, and the more the more patients you have that require pressors, the more experience you'll have. Um, you know, so I think that that is always, always the case, you know, but, but never have I had somebody wheel in with a patient and been like, I can't believe you didn't start vasopressors, or I can't believe you didn't give another two liters of fluid. I don't, do you guys feel like you ever get met with that? This is my individual experience. I think the, the amount of truly adversarial questioning that we get has decreased. Um, just like on the whole, uh, it used to be, used to be a real thing to just kind of go in and go in with the mindset that everything that you did in the field is going to be up for debate. Um, it, in my experience, it's not as much the case anymore. You still, I mean, you're just humans are going to be human and you're going to, yeah. you're going to butt heads. Um, but I really don't think it's adversarial um, anymore. And I think that that has kind of led to it. And, and with respect to your question, it's like, okay, they, they initiated a treatment. There was probably a reason behind it yeah. and, and just not give you flack for it. It's, you know, someone, may ask you why or what what did you see that we should be aware of or something like that, which is a perfectly reasonable question. Mm-hmm. Um, but never any outright holding up the bag, shaking, why the hell did you start dopamine <laughs> on this patient? Yeah, that, that was probably my own internal conflict. Like, should I really have done that or not? Because I, I have that all the time. Um, I think we all do. <laughs> yeah. So if you guys like, so like with your dopamine, if you start it, where do you start it? Like what? It, what's your usual go-to dose? I haven't started dopamine. I have not started dopamine in a... Hot minute. I've, really? So, I've, what do you what do you guys start now? Epi. I've moved moved exclusively personally to Epi. We have oh, it. We have it in our actually our guidelines, one of so. our physician okay. friends um, who is a medical director got rid of dopamine. Said we're not going to buy it anymore. Let's teach people how to start Epi drips. So you're making your Epi drips in the back of the buggy. Yes. Okay. I don't like. I don't, I don't hate that. I just am asking for clarity. No, that's fine. Uh, yeah. I, and. Hey, if you're passionate about it, let us know. But- well, I mean, like, look, uh, you know, 
you've got something that's going to hang for a temporary amount of time. So the sterility of it is really a minimal concern to me. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I just, for, for a short period of time, mm-hmm. um, you know, as long as you don't like throw it in the dirt and stomp on it, like what well, I'm kind of okay with. So that. Is sterility really a concern. I mean, is it a major concern? Or? It's a bigger concern for me when it hangs for hours. Okay. Right. Does that make sense? So, yeah. you know, when we teach our technicians to make stuff sterile in the hood, we go in and we watch their sterile technique and oh. how they go in and out of the bag. And then we take the bag and we throw it in the corner for a few weeks and we see what great right? that's not, like, it's not going to hang that okay. long. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. nothing's probably going to grow well of enough significance in that short time. Now, does that mean you should try to be clean? Yes, but I'm not worried about the sterility of it necessarily. So when I fly, even when we hang epi, uh, concentrated epi or mm-hmm. nor epi. Uh, four milligrams and 250. Mm-hmm. Uh, we mix it ourselves mm-hmm. in a helicopter or in the ER. That's I think what there's we used to do too. Yeah, I think I there's mean, something to be said to be able to have a pre mixed package. But yeah, it's it's, it's nice. It's, it's nice. I think you can also, your concerns are definitely valid because that, like, that, that opens you up for risk. Yeah. Uh, just at baseline, which opens you up for harm. But I think if you train appropriately, you know, none of our therapies are without risk. And yeah. that's, not to, that's not to mitigate the risk that's there. I just think if you work in a, a system that fosters that training and yep. you get that sort of didactic over and over and that reinforcement of good habits, yep. then it's going to, it's going to kind of help shield you a little bit against that risk. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, in that way, I think that that operating in a system like that and like making the move from dopamine to like, uh, and the service fluids described into a mixed epi drip, it, it opened up that conversation about vasopressors that wasn't happening prior. Yeah. So I think people were actually more confident in initiating, you know, appropriate vasopressor, vasopressor therapy than they were previously, just because the expectation previously was just open the bag, hook it on, titrate it to the blood pressure versus now, which is it's more of a, an open deliberate conversation. Hey, we have what, the evidence is probably shaken out to be a superior agent. We're just mm-hmm. going to standardize it across the board. And, you know, everyone seemed to be more comfortable with, hey, I'm going to initiate a vasopressor in the field because of X, Y, and Z reasons. And so they went with epi as, as the go-to because that way you hit anaphylaxis as well, essentially. So you essentially train. What, so when you guys got rid of dopamine. We basically got rid of dopamine because. And cost. Like, yeah, it expires. Less to, less to keep on. Yeah, you, know, you can yeah. take a, a milligram of cardiac epi and a liter bag of fluid. So I think and it's good forever. Just, yeah, you know, or for a long time. Yeah, I think we got rid of dopamine for a few reasons. Is that it's very arrhythmogenic, um, which wouldn't be bad if the patient's bradycardic, right? If you want to use right. it to try to increase the heart rate. Uh, but uh, another reason is that you're probably going to prove me wrong here. But I don't know that in terms of mortality that norepi has ever been proven to be superior to epi. Right. But norepi is recommended as the first line vasopressor for nearly everything. And I wanted to ask you about that because I I think I've heard you say this. uh, We should choose the right vasopressor for the job. Does that mean we should generally reach for norepi first and then figure out what we need to add on? Yeah. So so usually norepi first, right? So there's probably isolated number of cases uh, when we might go to something else first, um, you know, maybe some cardiogenic shock, maybe, right? But even then, we're going to have some higher level diagnostics going on and be able to see cardiac output and that sort of stuff. So norepi from a starting point is a great way to go. Um, so the reason why I asked that question, why you guys went to Epi over Norepi was where you're just trying to have like one thing that was sort of oh. easy for everyone to manage as we went opposed to, to having. I'm sorry. We went That's to right. Epi over dopamine. Okay. So Not, you still have Norepi. We, so on the ground, we don't have Norepi. Okay. Um, that's why we went with Epi because we don't have Norepi. Okay. We don't have pumps. Yep. We don't want to try to titrate concentrated nor epi or any concentrated yeah. vasopressor just by eyeballing it. And we figured it was much safer to put a milligram of epi in a liter bag, a very dilute concentration to where it it's it it's still possible to mess up, but it's mm-hmm. more difficult if somebody bumps the roller clip and opens it up yeah. then um it's it's Less likely to cause harm than if they had a very concentrated agent. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. So, and it's cheaper. Yeah. It is a lot cheaper because like, like, the premixes are fairly expensive. Oh, yeah. I believe it. You know, even the other premixes that we have from the third party outsourcing is 
yeah, it's quite a bit more expensive too. So anytime you can put a vial in a bag or a, you know, here you go. Yeah. Okay. That, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. Um, it's so much, it's so hard. It's hard for me to say, like, I'm going to pass judgment on you for what you're doing. Like your situation is very, very different. Right. So I think as long as I think the important thing is this, like, what can you do to standardize? What mm -hmm. can you do to protocolize? What can you do so that when you're under stress, what can you do to make it as simple as possible so that everybody is doing the same thing? Yeah. Right. I think that's probably the most important thing. Right. And it sounds like that's probably what you guys have done and why you have sort of one, you're trying to pick a better agent with going to epinephrine mm -hmm. over, over dopamine, um, you know, and, and maybe, right. Um, do I, do we think right now that probably there's a little bit better evidence with norepinephrine as far as from a side effect profile and that sort of thing? Yes. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at the end of the day, what do you need to do to stabilize the patient in that acute time period? It's hard for me to know, like, if you're starting something on the truck mm -hmm. for an hour, is that going to have a huge impact down the road if they get somewhere and they get switched to, does that make sense? Yeah. Versus is it done in an appropriate, safe manner? I think we should have pumps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we buy $40,000 monitors. You can buy a pump for like $2,000, not just in terms of patient safety, but in terms of risk mitigation, we don't have pumps on the ambulance. We're giving concentrated vasopressors mm -hmm. with dopamine under gravity. And not only that, we are transporting hospital pumps. If we take them out of the ER and they're on their pumps that we don't know how to operate. And if something malfunctions on that pump, what are we left? What are we to do? Battery dies. Yeah. Battery dies. Or <laughs> it gets air in the, it gets air in the line. Yeah. How do you yeah. clear the air? How do you titrate if you need to titrate some yeah. medication yeah. that you can? So that could be a liability. Just Are you guys allowed to adjust the pumps when they come out of a place? Um, I, It's not specifically written down. I think so. I've seen some protocols where you can titrate. It's, it, it specifically says you can titrate nitro. Yeah. Something it like that. It depends on okay. the system. So some, some you can. Some it's good form to call for orders. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that if it re it really does come down to the protocol, yeah, uh, and, or, or calling for orders. If uh, if you do feel, and I've 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 titrated it before, but typically after a med control consult, if it wasn't a medication that was directly in my scope, okay, um, or was protocolized as yes, you can titrate this medication, okay, um, and that's that's just better form, yeah. Um, be like, hey, his blood pressure is getting softer and softer. Care if we go up, you know, three mics, four mics, five mics a minute, right? Yeah, that's that's cool. Right. So it, it's typically no big deal. Um, you know, your your pain. You, if you have someone who's on an analgesic drip, especially if they're intubated, ventilated, and being transferred, they start showing signs of increased agitation, or you get increased pressures and stuff like that. Then I think that's an appropriate time to just titrate that pump up. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really think that needs a call for orders. That, that's that's my opinion, uh, and I could be wrong, and someone's probably going to tell me I'm wrong. Um, but in those situations, I think it's situation dependent as well. Mm -hmm. But generally, follow the protocol. And if you have any questions about call for orders, do you have anything? I have nothing to add on that. But um, I keep thinking about what you said about dopamine. Like, does it does it really hurt the patient if we give it for 30 or 40 minutes? Um, like, we know that it does long term if they're on it for a while. But we don't know. I mean, we really don't know. And, and I, I guess the question is, is... If it's if it's what somebody has and it's what they can yeah. do quickly and safely, yeah. My question is: Does getting it on board quickly in a safe manner do less harm in the long term? Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, yeah. If, if they lose a pulse and they and it's what you're, you know. So I think, you know, whatever you have needs to be standardized. There, you need to have probably a protocol or something to back you up to support you. You know, you need to be able and practice to be able to do it. Know where you're going to start you know, what dosing units you're using, that sort of stuff. Um, cause even that is not standard anymore. Right. So you guys are probably doing like what mics per minute or for dopamine, you're probably doing mics per kg per minute, but so are you doing mics per minute or what are you guys using as your units? I was actually, uh, wanting to ask just you about this. to ask you that question. Um, so for epi and nor epi, mm -hmm. there's some debate on this. Mm -hmm. Should it be a set two to 10 or two to 20 mics a minute or should it be weight based? 
So right now we do weight based. We switched to weight based uh, probably about four years ago in the hospital. Okay, um, and there's some thought that is it a little bit better, right? So you know, is two milligrams or two mic? Sorry, not two milligrams. Two micrograms of epinephrine per minute versus you know, in a fifty kilo patient versus a hundred kilo patient, the same thing. Probably not. But but the thing is, is we're titrating it to effect. Either so, way. Right. We're okay. going to titrate it to effect, right? Like yeah. you're going to start it and you're going to titrate it to where you want it to be. Um, so I think what's important when I think about this, like if people are using weight-based or not using weight-based, one, that you know what you're doing and that you know that, you know, five mics per minute is probably okay for epinephrine. But if you mess up your units and you do five mics per kg per minute, that's a very different okay. beast, right? Yeah. And so that that level of communication is important. So when when we originally switched to the mics per kg dosing and and a lot of the outside was still doing the, just the mics per minute, we actually had a lot of dosing errors initially. We had to do like a really? lot of education. Yeah, so we actually, yeah, let me see if I can find this. That's interesting. We actually yeah. uh, we actually made a table for our nurses so that they could like kind of ballpark at the bottom. Like if it came in in mics per minute, what does that mean in mics per kilo per minute and that sort of stuff. Oh, so that they cool. knew that they were in the ballpark because because really, you know, we're titrating these things to effect. So you just need to be in the ballpark. So but but it was an issue. In my mind, there is nothing out there that says mics per kg per minute is definitely the best way to go. You've got to go with it. We've got evidence that says that it's safer. It's whatever. We don't. It's, it just doesn't exist. No. It, it's it's hard to get that kind of evidence. But right. something can ex- just intrinsically make sense. Yes. And not necessarily need a randomized controlled trial to, to say so. <laughs> right. Like, I think that's one of those instances where it makes sense. And mm-hmm. if, it, if it mitigates risk, then it's probably a decent idea. And if it doesn't, is it any better or is it causing harm? Right. So well, it's, it's probably easier to get a decent starting spot and know what you're working on. Yeah. Right. So if you think about dopamine or you think about epinephrine, there's different spots when you start at those doses where you hit different receptors, right? So do you have a better shot of getting the spot that you want if you're using the mics per kilo versus the flat dose, right? Do you find that when you you, you start off with weight-based, or is your initial starting dose usually higher, higher than it would be if you start off at like two or three mics a minute? This is where the art comes in. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, my starting dose of pressors varies a lot. So if I have somebody that's peri-arrest, mm. I'm going to go way up on the high end and I'm going to back down hoping that I won't lose a pulse. You're probably going to go with a push dose epi, right? You know, it, de- <laughs> it depends. Like a lot of times peri-arrest, when you first get pres- when you first get a pulse back, you actually have okay pressure, right? You'll, you'll look at your systolics, your systolics will be in the 80s or 200s. And a lot of times I'll turn to, especially like the young residents, be like, what drip do you want ready? And they'll be like, look at their systolic. I'm not going to need, yeah. no, no, you are going to need one in a few minutes. Which one do you want, right? Like, so in that situation, I have a tendency to get ready ahead of time, yeah. right? A- and I can be proactive about that. Um, but in that situation, I would start high. Right. Versus like if you're giving somebody fluid and they've got a little bit of reserve and you're trying to find that sweet spot and see like I just want to give them just a little bit more because they don't so seem to be need a nudge. Yeah, yeah. Then I would start low. Right. And and I think this is why pressers are so hard for people because there's not like a perfect you start at 0. 0.02 mics per kg per minute every single <laughs> right. You, you can't it, do and that. And it's hard to protocolize. Yeah, that, it that's, is. That's, I think it's a lot of the heartburn for EMS, too, is it's it is it is so dependent on the patient's physiology, on their history, and on the individual situation that yeah. it can kind of be difficult to pinpoint a a really good starting level. Yeah. And you end up having to apply a little bit of gestalt, which you can't really protocolize that well. No. Um, and I think, I think the solution to that is getting the education on, okay, so we understand that we can't just do, you know, Amazon Prime at, you know, flat rate, your vasopressor dose. But in this situation, and in this situation, that's a little bit more broader. We can try and start here. Here's where you might want to move up or down mm-hmm. or so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. And, you know, your, your classic or the, the example for me that comes to mind in, in what you're talking about is the, the septic patient who's a little bit more cryptic versus the yeah. one who is not trying to, trying to die on nasodilated. Yes. Right. And they, they are just trying to meet Jesus in the worst right. way. And that, that's it's the same pathology. Right. But it's going to be a wildly different dose of vasopressor. Right, right. 
And don't some patients respond diff- differently depending on the the type of vasopressor? Like some are more responsive to epi, some norepi. Is that a thing? You know, sometimes people re, re- um, sometimes people respond differently. Like we had a an overdose that was in was a month or so ago that like we would put on um, you know I think it was epinephrine and his heart rate would go through the roof. Right, like like up in the 180s, like just really? crazy. And you just wanted like a little bit of like, you know, he was a little bit bradycardic initially. We wanted a little bit of squeeze, you know, to kind of help his blood pressure. And so sometimes you'll get, and then we put him on, you know, ep- or norepinephrine and he seemed kind of okay. So sometimes you'll huh. see weird stuff like that, but probably the, I mean, I think that's the rarity, right? Like that's probably not the case that I would, you know, like there's definitely a difference. No, right. Um, but I think what we probably have is, you know, when you see people that don't respond well, my question is, you know, how acidotic are they? Mm. You know, because we know as patients get more acidotic, we know our pressors don't work as well. Yes. Right. Uh, um, and so is it some of that? Right. So you're saying we should just load them up on sodium bicarb. <laughs> <laughs> I am not saying that. <laughs> And that is a whole huge bag of tricks. <laughs> you want to do another podcast tonight? Yeah, we'll on, do it on bicarb. On, on bicarb, yeah, and why that's a bad idea. <laughs> stacking vasopressors yep. or stacking pressors. If I tra- if I'm transporting a patient on norepi and they're maxed out, I don't even know what max is. What's considered maxed out? <laughs> um, it yeah. also depends. <laughs> I would imagine like because twenty mics a minute. Epi, well, epi is. It's 30, physiologic. 30? So I think I would, I know I'm not a pharmacist. Where do you start getting uncomfortable where you're saying we need to put something else on? So there's not like a hard max, right? Like, so if you look at like our institution protocols, we have a max listed. Okay. But like, if you need to go above the max while you're getting another presser ready or whatever, yes. Right. There are some institutions that don't have any maxes oh, and wow. they will just like keep letting it roll. Right. Pour, so, it, pour it to them. So I think it depends for me, you know, when I start getting up around, so, so like for norepi, when I start getting up around 0.8, I start worrying about like, have we 0.8 mics per kg per minute, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So in the microgram people world. Okay. What's, (laughs) because I I honestly, I'm not familiar with that. I don't know what that means. So like, I'm trying to think, it's been so long since we've done the, um, hang on, I'm going to cheat. Don't judge me. It's been so long since I've done the, uh, the standard, uh, the standard weight. Isn't that awful? I used to do this all the time. (laughs) So it depends, right? Like when you start getting up above, like, you know, for epinephrine, when you start getting up above, you know, the 10 mics per minute, right? Okay. When you start getting up above probably 20 in norepi, that sort of stuff. I think what I worry about is, have you just gotten everything out of it you're going to get out of it? Uh, Does that yeah. make How sense? How much of this is beating the dead horse? Right. Like, are you just dumping more into the system and you're probably not getting any more bag for your buck? So, so like, it, I keep going up and I'm not seeing anything happening. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so then in my in my mind, I wonder if we need to add something else to complement, you know, and then and, and somebody that with the septic that's acidotic, you know, maybe that's vasopressin. You know, we know that that works mm-hmm. a little bit better in an acidotic system. Um, and somebody that's bradycardic, you know, do I need to add something that's got a little bit more ionotropy in it, a little bit more okay. epi or, or something like that? Um, you know, we don't use dopamine a whole lot more, a whole lot in the hospital either. Um, very few of my physicians really, really like to use it. Yeah. Uh, first line, if even second line. Um, the one caveat is maybe sometimes in toxicology patients that are bradycardic and yeah. hypotensive, that's kind of the time that we will see, occasionally see it pulled out. Um, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. So, and it's see that you want to, you want that exaggerated increase Mm -hmm. in heart rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so for me, I just, you know, I think a lot of us are kind of of the mind that once you get above a certain, is it really giving you any more? It's probably need to add something else. So there's no true ceiling. There's not a true ceiling. No. Right. And like, I really don't think there, there, there is a true ceiling. And you could probably speak more to the effects of the medication, but. It, you know, it, it's physiologic. You're going to have some effect exerted. And as long as you're not getting into harm, theoretically, you could go as high as you wanted to. Right. But at, at what point is this just kind of screaming at the wailing wall? Well, and then you have to worry about like, if you're at these really, really high doses, do you have more adverse effects? Yes. Yes. Right. So is it better for me to be add another one on, maybe have doses lower? Right. So you and think maybe their not. fingertips are like white? <laughs> 
That's like the I ceiling. go around and, and check, or like maybe I could like listen to gut sounds and hear the gut ischemia happening. <laughs> Do you? I mean, no, no. Okay. <laughs> that's, Have you that's seen a joke. like a, a de- like such a decrease in distal extremity blood like, flow you're like ischemia like uh, acutely i feel like that we probably don't have them long enough in the er to see that but okay. there is ischemia that happens when you get people that are on pressures long term and like especially high dose mm-hmm. speaking of so can you speak to the safety of peripherally placed vasopressors yes so you know for a long time we were taught um, you had to have a central line to do it, right? So there's sort of this old dogma, this old lore that that's the only way that you can give vasopressors. But the thing is, is like, how often do we have a central line? I know I don't have it all the time in the ER. I know you all certainly don't have it when you're picking people up. I mean, you know, you can do it, right? Like we do it all the time. And, and the thing is, is you've got you know, the people that say you shouldn't do it, you can't do it, you've got to have a central line. Well, that's really easy to say when you have the ability to do the central line, <laughs> right? But if you have somebody and you guys have seen these people that their pressure soft or they're crashing or whatever, you can't wait for a central line, right? And central lines themselves are, are not benign, yeah. right? And so it's a risk versus benefit analysis. Um, you know, for me, we do peripheral vasopressors all the time. But in my simple head, what I think is... If you get to a point where you're going, you know, they're going to be on that infusion for a prolonged period of time, you probably need a central line, Mm -hmm. right? So for you guys, when you think about running these things peripherally, what you need to think about is what's the best IV you got and the best vein Hmm. that you have. Right. Big, big vein. Yeah, big vein, preferably, right? Like not the thumb, right? <laughs> not the whatever 23 gauge and the whatever, you're, you know, like in the thumb. Like preferably you'd like to be above the wrist, okay? okay. Um, if you could have a bigger gauge IV, that's better. Try to have your blood pressure cuff on the opposite side. Um, you know, those are things that we think mm. about. I think the concentration thing is interesting. So when you think about running stuff for a peripheral through a peripheral line, what we're worried about is like extravasation and local tissue damage and necrosis and that sort of thing, which which is a problem if these things extravasate. I think because we, of like the tonicity of it, or is the drug itself just it's the way that coagulate. it constricts and okay. it just yeah impairs infu- uh, impairs perfusion. Um, but you know. I don't know. I don't know that there's a lot of consensus out there about is the more concentrated drug worse than the more dilute drug? Mm-hmm. I think we think that it's probably better to be diluted, right? Yeah. So is it not quite as potent at the site? Um, I think really probably what it depends is how much actual drug are you getting at the site, right? Does like your whole entire bag of dirty epi extravasate or is it a mill of, right? Yeah. Of the, so I think it kind of depends. Um, I think most of us feel a little bit better when we have the less concentrated stuff about it being a little bit better tolerated by the patient and being a little bit less, um, less prone to severe complications. Right. right. Yeah. So what do we do? Like what happens if, if, extravasation occurs what what's the worst could that could happen and like how do we manage it so for you guys if something extravasates for you what you should do is stop it Mm -hmm. right obviously disconnect your line um if you can aspirate so like pull back at the site to try to get as much fluid out as you can that is helpful then the question is is should you remove the line or not if it's something like our pressors where we have some antidotes for it, if it's a significant amount that extravasated, it may be helpful to leave the line because we can give things like fentolamine and through that, and then we'll also inject around the site. However, if you remove the line, it's not going to stop us from doing that either, right? You can elevate it. You could put a compress on it if you had it. Um so yeah, we so shouldn't try to flush it. Don't so. flush it. Do not <laughs> flush Keep running the line. Around. I feel like that's happened before. <laughs> have you seen any uh, patients lose like digits or anything from i that? personally haven't but but we know it's happened right you hear and the stories know. from like d50 and fenugrin so i was yeah. just wondering if there there have been like any cases like i have not personally had a case but yes there have been cases of people you know having some pretty profound ischemia and some pretty mm. profound necrosis so one point for the dirty epidrip. One point for the dirty epidrip. <laughs> the, the singular one. <laughs> I don't. I don't hate the dirty epidrip. I. I don't hate it in your guys' setting, right? I don't hate it in a helicopter. I. I don't hate it there, right? Like because you don't have a premix that you can get to quickly, 
it's probably an easy way to do it. And you don't have a pump. So, you know, the math seems to work out. It's one mic per mil, right? So yeah. it's, mm-hmm. it's easy. easy. Right. So so you tick off some of the things you've got something that's standardized, you've got something that's pretty easy, you've got something that you can do kind of quickly. And I think as long as you can do those things, if you have a protocol to do those things, that's probably OK. All yeah, right? I think the, the criticisms of it are valid. Yeah. Like it, it could definitely end up being a safety issue. But that also that's not to denigrate that. But I mean, those also apply to just about everything we do. Yeah. You know, I think in my area, the dirty epi drip is a problem. Right. Because then we have a non-standard concentration Mm. that's in there. And if you're Mm. coming to a hospital, to a level one trauma center, to a tertiary care center, you have the ability to have something done in micrograms per kilo per minute at an exact rate. And I think that we should do that. (laughs) (laughs) So, but, you know, you got to use what you have. You got to, you know, dance with who you brung. So, you know, I think, you know, if there are places that are using that or if you guys are using it, I just think that you need a a good solid way that you're doing it, a good way to label so that it's not just in a normal saline bag hanging up there with like epi rootin and small magic marker that no one can see. And then they come in and we just like bolus them because we think it's the rest of the fluids. How about yeah. this? I don't call it a dirty epi drip. I call it an epi drip. And I put a big piece of tape on it and take a marker and put the concentration on there. Is that better? I think it's better. I think labeling is always better, <laughs> That's right? That's what I do. Yeah. I mean, I think it's got to be labeled, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and you've got to know what you got. And, and you know, when you come in and you're transitioning care of that patient, you got to communicate what you got so that it doesn't get confused, you know. Um, but I think as long as you guys have a standard way that you're doing it, it's probably okay. In my setting, I don't think it's okay. The high-performing EMS agency would have pre-prepared labels for you to use. Maybe you could have that for your guys. We could. Uh, we're could not currently, um, the place I'm working now, we're not currently doing something like that, but I'm looking to uh, implement that. And mm-hmm. when, if and when we do, uh, we'll definitely have labels prepared. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's like one less step and it's kind of one more safety, you know, measure. Uh, it's I actually may- easier to do than... Yeah, pop off some three inch tape and then try and scribble while you're mm-hmm. bouncing down the back. Yeah, and it's all done. And it and looks and, better. Yeah, I mean, we run into the same thing with push dose pressors too. You know, so do you do you guys make your push dose epi? Then have you guys do you guys do that in the back mm-hmm. of the truck? Yes. How so are you making it? Probably in the least sterile way. <laughs> uh, <Okay>. Using <laughs> a flush, okay, a, a needle, and inserting it into uh, or expelling one cc. Uh, okay. From the flush, and then I draw it up from a one to ten thousand concentration uh, pre-filled epi. Yeah, yes, yeah, so the carp eject, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There are issues with that, right? I mean, with the sterility of it, sterility and maybe safety. There was a paper that uh, we we talked about. There are. I think you know when you think about the sterility stuff. Like I said, I worry more about that for long-term stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, I worry about it less if you're doing it for immediate use as a temporizing measure. I'm, I'm less like you, I think you should try to be clean, but, I, but you're not going to make something. I don't well, make stuff more in the push dose epi land. Sterility yeah, is kind of, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's a thought that's in there somewhere, right. but it is not the primary thought. No, no. I'd much rather that you like maintain that patient's pulse and, and keep on keeping But the on. things that the study authors brought up with medication errors and with, with labeling and you run the very real risk if you're not cor- correctly labeling of, Thinking you're flushing a line for patency and giving them, you know, a fairly substantial yeah. bolus of, of epinephrine. And most people do what you guys did is they put it in a flush and then it looks like a flush. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And that that is a huge problem. So the other problem is, is there's a bunch of different concentrations, not a bunch, you know, a few different concentrations of epinephrine out there as far as concentrated product. So, you know, you have the Carpugex, which is the one to 10,000, which we're supposed to stop using the ratio nomenclature <laughs> yeah. now. It's yeah. now one milligram per 10 mLs, right? Um, you have the concentrated product like we use in anaphylaxis, which is one milligram per one mL. We have a similar product in a vigor vial that we use to make, we used to use to make our drips. Um, but, you know, the, the errors that I have seen real world. So we had a physician that turned and said, I want push dose pressers, pull a mill out, shoot a mill out of the flush, pull a mill up and then pass it back to me. And the person making it did just that, but they did it with the one milligram per mil vial. So they made one to 10,000. So they Oops. made a carp eject. Yeah. 
right? So the thing is, is if you're going to do it, you got to know what you're doing, right? And you have to be a communicator about what you're doing. And, yeah. you know, when I teach this to the, to the EM residents, what we try to teach them is you need to know your dose, right? You need to know, I want to know how many micrograms you're wanting to give. I want to know what microgram solution you want in that vial. Um, if you're going to ask me to make it, um, you know, I think it's just error prone. Okay. I think the other thing that you have to think about labeling is so important. You know, um, having a flush sitting around with epinephrine in it, not having it appropriately labeled, bad things are probably going to happen, you know, and, and I have seen bad things happen. Yeah. Um, and, and so to say that um, it doesn't happen is or it's not that unsafe, or I know how to do it, uh, you know, it's going to be done. Well, but if you're running a code and mm -hmm. you have somebody that doesn't know what they're doing. So I think the way that you can do this is you can standardize it. If you, you, know, you can use the phenylephrine sticks for RSI that are a pre-made concentration that are a commercially available product. That That's one way to kind of get around it. I'm not as crazy about phenylephrine. <laughs> I personally like epinephrine a little bit better. Um, but that's one way. Or, you know, do you do a similar thing? If you guys are going to use push dose pressures, do you have a label in there that says, this is what I'm going to throw on my syringe when I make it. This is what it is. This is how it's made on the label. This is what the concentration is. This is approximately how much should get pushed. You know, can you mm -hmm. do things like that? So we have done things like that with, um, with different products to kind of try to help standardize it so that people get less confused. But you know, this is an era of shortages for everything. Yeah. You know, yes. so I don't know if you guys had trouble getting the carp ejects of Epi, but you yes. know, for a yeah. while we had a lot of problem with that. Right now we're struggling with bicarb. I don't know if you guys are struggling with bicarb, but you know, this is, this is, is kind of what it is. So um, I think, you know, just anticipating those things is important. But like I said, you know, with all of those things, the dirty epi drip with push dose pressers, whatever, you got to be thinking about your end game because your end game is not going to be yeah. sitting there for hours giving a little. Oh, absolutely. Right. Not. Um, and I think sometimes people get tunnel vision. They get really excited. I'm going to do right. Um, but thinking about the end game is important. Yeah, it's just a, it's generally a bridge. Right. Yeah. It's a temporizing measure and you have to have a plan. Um, so the issue with sterility. Yep. And um, I've never heard of this before. So once you break that seal on a flush, like you engage that, you push that plunger in, when you pull it back out, that's when it's not sterile anymore mm -hmm. because. You've uh, broken it essentially. Yeah. yeah. So if you have just a regular 10 cc syringe, then the plunger's all the way in. You pull that out once, mm -hmm. and that's all you're really allowed technically, right? Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. And there are ways you can get around it. Like you can put the carp eject together, and most of the carp ejects have a needleless and a non needleless system on it, right? Mm -hmm. So you can take. The, so that the needles expose the green part off, right, you, where the lure lock portion, you can pull that off and you can actually pull your syringe back so that it's to the volume you want it. So to the 10 mLs and you can actually shoot in your syringe with your carp eject. But, don't, but you have to expel. So, so you have your flush, mm -hmm. you pushed your mill out, mm -hmm. you pull it back to 10 so that there's air in the top of the syringe, you're holding it. You mm -hmm. take your lure lock off your carp eject, you stick the needle into the hole of the flush, oh. and you fill up the air. Huh. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's one way you can get around it. Depending on what syringes you have, sometimes a little tiny needle on there isn't quite enough. The other way you can do it is you can stick a blunt on the end of it, do the same thing. So that's one way you can get around it. Usually if I'm at a code and I'm making multiple doses like the when i think about doing this is mostly little people right when i'm drawing yeah. up more but mm -hmm. that's the way i can get more doses out of one is putting a putting a needle on the end and shooting it into the okay. syringe you do that way they also make devices that lock onto the end that make it so you can hook another syringe on the other side and pull so you can do it that way so as well. like a stopcock kind of like a stopcock yeah essentially it's just two-way instead and it doesn't have oh. the yeah oh yeah mm -hmm. i think i've seen those mm-hmm so Very. there's a couple ways you can get, but technically, yeah, it's like one time use. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. That's pretty nifty. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, so I think there was something else that you wanted to talk about. It was uh, like uh, patient handoffs. Yeah. So transitions of care. So I think, you know, like I said, part of my job, I feel like is always trying to figure out how to make stuff safer. And, and one area that I, you know, teach the nurses a lot about 
and talk with them a lot about is, you know, the transition of care piece. So you guys roll in, maybe you have somebody on pressors, maybe you have them on whatever drip, maybe you have them on heparin, maybe you have them on insulin, whatever. Um, there's a few things that I think need to be thought about. So with our vasopressors, you know, the half-life of these things is, is minutes, okay. right? So if you have somebody on a presser, they truly need the vasopressor support and you turn that off, it's gone pretty quickly, right? So one thing I try to get crews to do, and if we're there, we'll get it and get it started really fast is, hey, leave your drips on, let us get ours up. What are you running it at? Let's get ours going and then you can stop your pumps and pull them off. So we have had patients that have come in, stuff has gotten stopped and we've had people crump on us, right? Mm. So thinking about that when you're rolling into and starting to kind of transition the patient over, I think thinking about what agent is it? Is it something that's got a short half-life? You know, it might be better if you continue it. Now, there are times when the when you'll roll in and maybe you've done a little bit of fluid resuscitation, they look a little bit better, but we might want to hold something. But um, the vast majority of the time, we're thinking about probably continuing until we can kind of mm-hmm. get a little bit of work up. So that's one area that um, I try to try. I try to coach the folks on my side to be on. You know, um, I think I get really, really nervous when there's ionotropes going and people just like shut those off in peace. That makes me really nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Not my patient anymore. <laughs> yeah. Like, what do you mean you stopped? <laughs> yeah. Um, so that makes me nervous. So, so those are instances. And the other thing that I think I sometimes see is be like, all right, what do you want to start? Or what, what's your drip running at? And they'll be like 10 mils a minute. And I'm like, oh, What's okay, what does that mean? And they're like, well, it's running at 10 mils a minute. And and to most people, when you think about IV fluids, 10 mils a minute or 10 mils an hour or whatever is probably fine. Yeah. But in presser land, that's not okay because, you know, maybe your epinephrine drip is four, right? Four milligrams and 250 mils. Or maybe you made your epinephrine drip yeah. dirty and my concentration is eight milligrams per mil. And so... Concentration over yeah, volume delivered. Right, exactly. So you've got to have a concentration over your volume or, or a concentration over your time. That's that's really, hmm. really important. So I think when I see areas for opportunity or areas where I try to do a lot of coaching and teaching is, okay, that doesn't mean a whole lot to me because my concentration is probably not the same as yours. And so when you're rolling into somewhere being um, really thoughtful about saying milligrams per, or micrograms or units per minute or hour, I think is very, very important. I see a lot of drug errors that way. I never, I never put much thought in, into it, honestly. And, and it, but nobody does. Yeah. And then when I'm like, you know, that doesn't really mean anything, right? And yeah. I asked my nurse, I was like, how do you know? I'm like, I, sometimes when I'm feeling kind of feisty, I'll be like, let's see you and I sit down and do the math. Their concentration was this, and our concentration was this, and this was how many mils an hour it was running at. What do you want to start your drip at? And they're like, oh my God, I now get it, right? Because yeah. it's just not. It's, a, it's, it's so deceptive. Yeah. It's, it 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 you see it 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 seems innocuous to ha- to kind of focus in on your units of measure, but when you when you actually sit down and do the math out and then translate that to what just happened to a patient, it makes a lot more sense to to me yeah. now that you like frame it like that. Yeah, you know, because you can you can have or double a dose very quickly, and you know, for your pressers and stuff, we're titrating those to effect. So probably if it happened, we would probably be titrating in an ideal world very mm-hmm. quickly anyway. So hopefully we would catch if something mm-hmm. was grossly off. But like some things like heparin, that's huge. And yeah. there's yes. different, right? Or insulin can be the same way. Um, you know, so some of your other things, it can be a very big deal. Like nicardipine is another one. There's different concentrations that are out there. You know, that drug has a lot longer half-life. So you may not see those instantaneous effects like you see with our pressors. So, you know. Magnesium. The, you yeah. see different <laughs> yeah. concentrations. Right. Right. Yeah. There's one grams and two grams. And mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I tell all of my people that when you're transporting a patient, whether or not you're using the hospital's pump or you're putting them on your own pump, you need to double check the concentration mm-hmm. um, because some nurses are used to just doing so many mLs an hour or so many mLs a minute or an hour, and um, and mm-hmm. the concentration may be different. Yeah. And so they use the typical mLs per hour. Um, so we need to just kind of pay attention to that a little bit. Yeah. And so, if, if I'm taking from a facility – and it's a medication that they have a, a, a chart or a protocol for, like heparin or their um, their benzos for sedation. I'll typically ask them for that chart. 
you know, yeah. and actually go through and double check and double check the units on the it's it's nothing against them it's just, I want to make sure that yeah, it's good the, practice trust, the, the, trust the, but verify yeah, right yeah. the yeah. that the concentrations I'm dealing with are the same and I'll I'll write mm-hmm. it out on mine mm-hmm. and I and it's doubly so if I'm transferring a like a heparin drip to my pump mm-hmm. like typically I'll do the math twice and then have someone else do it too yeah, yeah. just to make sure yeah and for that for that reason be like oh it's at 125 an hour yeah or just I mean, that that's not the heparin drip but you, you it opens you up for some serious error. <laughs> it totally does, and it and it's especially with the pressers where we're doing mics per kg per minute versus mics per you know. So we we've had patients that have come in and got it started on the wrong dose, I mean, like a very big dose that they probably shouldn't. You know, we catch it very quickly, thankfully, because it's titrated quickly. But it's, <laughs> yeah, but it's important, right? Units are important, um, and I think that's probably the biggest one of the biggest things that I could impress on people. On both sides, right? On our side, the people receiving and you all passing off. Super important. <laughs> you have anything really, else you would like to put out there? I don't think so. I Regan, think that's that all would... that I, I think that's all that I got. This was, I really enjoyed this podcast. Yeah, this is excellent. I hope I answered your questions. <laughs> like it gave you a lot of gray area. Well, yeah, there's a lot of gray area. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, the color of medicine is largely gray. Mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. It's art, it's science, and there's, it's, very much non-binary. Yeah, yeah. It's how real world people are dealing with patients. Yeah. And uh, Regan, we do appreciate you. Thank you very much. This is you're a wealth of knowledge and an excellent. It shows. So uh, that's all for now, guys. Uh, if you have any questions for Regan, are you a big social media person, or are you? I mean, I'm on a little bit, probably not as much as I should be. Uh, Do you want to share your Twitter handle? Yeah, I'll give you my Twitter handle. Okay. I should know when. I <laughs> I'm the same way. Well, while she's looking up her Twitter handle, uh, ours is at Curb to Bed. Uh, and our email is Curb to Bed at gmail.com. And, um, <laughs> I've been studying for a lot of stuff the last nine months, so I'm like not in or on anything right now. Um, so I'm at KYEM FarmDs. But if you guys, um, yeah, if anybody has any questions or if I need to, you know, elaborate on something, there'll probably be some people that will disagree with some of the things. That's okay. Good. <laughs> Life's like- no fun in an echo chamber. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, all right, guys. Thanks for listening. All right, bye. <laughs>